our story for a moment before the big finale and uh, unpack what's been going on. We've been journeying with Ali in search of a hero, exploring the kingdom of power and of greed and of romance. I want to pause and look at each of those in the real, our real world for the moment. Remember, they're off to the land of far, far away, but on the other hand, they're also talking about reality. You know, certainly for me, the, the things that were important as a 20-year-old, I didn't come from any sort of church heritage, were things like certainly money and romance. Didn't really need anything else, but it's not what I think now. The first one we explored was the kingdom of power, and we saw the Maleficent character with the, with, the, with the staff. And often in these stories, the villain is betrayed as having great power. I think of um, the classic book, Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, and that one ring of power would give people enormous, almost invincibility, but it would also corrupt and destroy them. And we think of the hero of that story, Frodo, even he, uh, righteous Frodo, by the end of the story, he didn't want to throw the ring into the lake of fire, but rather decided to keep it. And if Smeagol hadn't have bitten it off his finger and fallen into the lake of fire, Frodo would have failed. Um, and, and Tolkien's an interesting character. You know, I, um, when I was in England, I went to Oxford and sat in the pub where he and um, C.S. Lewis, the author of the Narnia Tales, and a couple of other fellows used to sit once a week and have a pint and talk about English literature. Tolkien was deeply influenced by Jesus' teachings about good and evil, as was C.S. Lewis. And uh, his influence of the power being something that can corrupt when it's coming from a dark source. We see that in the Scriptures. Have a look at this here. This is Jesus talking to Paul in a vision. Jesus says this, I'm sending you, sending you, Paul, to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins in a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. There's that concept of dark power from Satan. Paul's message was to set people free from that and introduce them to the kingdom of light, Jesus. But hey, look, power is important for some people. I've known a few CEOs in my time, and uh, they're directing major companies, and they love that position of power. What about you? Why don't you take that little card out again for a moment, the one we started filling in earlier, and just turn it over to the second side and jot in the word there. The first word to jot in is power. Is a real hero someone who has power? Just jot that word in in your cards this morning. The word power. And if you think, hey, yeah, that's me. Tick it. Tick the box. Yeah, that is me. The second kingdom we looked at was the kingdom of greed. The kingdom of greed. You know, and that starts from when you were a little kid. I remember growing up and it's like, yeah, you'd be advertising that you need this, this latest skateboard or this really funky bike or today it might be the latest Xbox games. You've got to have this stuff, man. Uh, and then as an adult, it might be, you know, if you just got this um, sports car or this prestige vehicle, go buy a new one of these and, man, life is going to be great. Or you've got the large home with the luxurious furniture or you've got the, the money for, you know, expensive holidays. It's those things that we're told, hey, look, if you're doing that, you're going to enjoy life. But is the money worth the price you pay? I've got a book at home titled Wealthiest Losers. And it has people that are wealthy because they're famous or businessmen or inheritance or even luck. And it talks about each of their lives. And for most of them, life wasn't great, despite incredible amounts of money. Wealthy man, Jim Carrey, the actor and comedian, he says this, I think everyone should be rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so they can see that's not the answer. Jesus himself said this, life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Nothing wrong with possessions, but he's saying there's more to it. You'll not find life with the money that affords you possession. 
One of Jesus' followers, the Apostle Paul, said these words. He said that um, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Now, I had a boss in one of my workplaces who did not believe that at all. He used to have this little thing on his, um, his office desk, 52 proverbs for the year, and you flick one over each week. And he, one of his proverbs one week was this, the lack, the lack of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Uh, what about you? What do you think? Pluck out that card again and just jot down the second one here. Is a real hero someone who offers money? Jot down that word money. And if you're thinking, hey, that's, that is what it's all about, just tick that box. Say, yep, that's it. That's it for me, definitely money. One more. The kingdom of romance. The kingdom of romance. Yeah, that, that, that scene. <laughs> You know, a lot of what you see in the, um, the movies influences our idea of romance. You know, we, we see um, Hollywood films and you see a very good-looking guy who falls in love with a very attractive woman and there seems to be about sparks of chemistry and infatuation, which actually, it can be argued, won't last. I'm doing... Um, some pre-marriage counselling with a lovely young couple who are here today. And when we were watching a clip this week, uh, as part of the teaching, it said this, this sort of love is often called infatuation, which is, chem- which is a chemical process, according to psychology, that can last from three hours to three years. In any romantic relationship, these feelings will come and go. In other words, what the psychologist will say is that feeling of infatuation, it's short-lived, at most three years. And so if you want a lasting relationship, it's got to be built on something deeper than that. Now, I know I mentioned the word marriage there a moment ago, and some of you might be thinking, yeah, but what? I don't agree with marriage anyway. Marriage is just a bit of paper. It's not, not, not the thing. Well, interesting, in the same course that we were watching, it also identified something that was interesting. It said that de facto relationships are five times more likely to break up than a marriage. Marriage, 50-50 chance of it working. The fact our relationship, a one in five chance. And you might be saying, hey, but well, I don't care about long-term relationships anyway. You know, I just want to have lots of short-term relationships. That's fine for me. Lead singer of the rock group, Queen, very much lived that way, Freddie Mercury. He died young, and towards the end of his life, he said this, You can have everything in the world and still be the loneliest man. The short-term relationships didn't really work for him. I used to listen to um, a guy who's a a biker called John Smith. He started a biker organisation called God Squad uh, here in Melbourne. And um, John's a great speaker, actually. He's written some great books. In one of his books, he tells a story about a biker friend of his who felt that he'd come to a great revelation and he wanted people to know about it. And so he went down to the heart of Melbourne, wore his bikey leathers and a pretty little wedding veil. And he held up a sign and the sign said this, don't try to get from your wife what you can only get from God. And obviously people sometimes would say, what's that all about? And he'd have a conversation with them and he'd say something like this to them. He thought his wife should give him the fulfillment he needs, but he discovered people have a spiritual center no person can fill, only God. And that was kind of the explanation he would give them. He felt that his wife should be giving him the fulfillment he needs, their marriage broke up, and then he came to this realization, I was trying to fill a God-shaped void with a person. And people do that all the time. They try and fill that center within them with something that's actually not going to ever fill that part of their life. Now, you might disagree. You might be saying, hey, Lee, totally disagree, mate. If I could just go out with that girl that I like or that guy, I'm sorted. I'm good. (laughs) Well, take out that card one more time here. It's the third one, third point. And jot down, the real hero is someone who offers romance. Jot that word romance in. And you think, actually, that is what it's about for me. 
Tick that box. Now, actually, the Bible has quite a different definition of what love is about. Now, that same guy, Paul, is inspired by God to write these words. He says, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others. It's not self-seeking, it's not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love is eternal. So the biblical definition of love is more of a, a selfless love. It even uses that phrase in the description. A sacrificial love where you're putting the other person first. The concept is that can be more of a lasting love. Jesus is the ultimate example of this. On one occasion, he said these words, Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. And here Jesus wasn't just being a bit poetic. He actually meant what he was saying. He went on to explain the time will come when I will die on a Roman cross, but it will be for you, my disciples. It will be for the people of the world. And in a cosmic way, which is not easy to explain, Jesus would bear the sins of humanity, past, present, and future. He's the divine son of God, lives beyond time. Bono from U2, the lead singer of that group, puts it this way in his own biography. He writes, I love the idea of the sacrificial lamb. The point of the death of Christ is that Christ took on the sins of the world so that what we put out did not come back on us, the bad things we do, he means, and that our sinful nature does not reap the obvious death, spiritual death. That's the point. It should keep us humbled. It's not our own good works that gets us through the gates of heaven. Jesus himself explained what he was going to do on the cross this way. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life or eternal life. He later, in that same book of the Bible recorded by his friend John, he explained what eternal life's all about. He says it's about knowing you, the only true God. You could start a relationship with God today. You know, I'm, I can remember when I was about 22 years old, I did not know God. And I remember one night saying something like this, God, I don't know if you're real or not. If you are real, could you reveal yourself to me? Help me know that you're real. And that started me on a journey. We could pray a prayer today that could start you on that journey. Wouldn't it be worth knowing if God is real? There's more to life than power, money, and romance. Ali discovers that she does not need a fairy tale hero because Jesus is the real hero she needs. If you'd like to start that relationship with God, let me, let me lead you in a prayer. Prayer is just talking to God, and it's how any relationship with God commences. Let's bow our heads in a moment of respect to God. And just join me in this prayer. Jesus, thank you that you gave your life to be born into this world. Thank you for a time you left your throne in heaven. Jesus, thank you that you gave your life to serve others, healing the sick, teaching the confused, feeding the hungry, washing the feet of your disciples. But most of all, thank you that you gave your life to die on a Roman cross and bear the sins of the world. Jesus, you are the hero I need. I accept your sacrifice. Amen.